As many of us know, African history has been denigrated for quite some time. Fortunately, the modern era has advanced more genuine scholarship. We still have our struggles, but with new perspectives and access, we've collectively been able to put the pieces of history together a lot better. But today, I wanted to briefly remind the diaspora of how intellectually dishonest some early scholarship was when it came to the discourse of Africa's achievements. <laughs> What up African world, it's Home Team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and contributing to this content. On Patreon, you can find more in-depth courses on African history. The link to Patreon is in the description box below. Interestingly enough, early scholarship from what I've seen is a mixed bag. You can certainly find some of the most honest and genuine reflections of African civilization from non-African explorers and observers. So it's not completely fair to say that all early scholarship or observation concerning African civilization was disingenuous or bankrupt. The idea of African achievement or civilization was perhaps so controversial during those times due to the perceived equivalence between enslavement and historical or moral failure. On a surface level, that mindset may be an effect of utility as it relates to morally justifying violent actions, but it was clearly ineffective in measuring or evaluating all components of human potential, intellect, or activity. This is one of the reasons why we see the patently ridiculous claims of early travelers and scholars when assessing African achievements. Their paradigm is calibrated to explain it away. One African achievement that was initially attributed to outside sources was the fantastic ruins of Great Zimbabwe. Believed to have been built around the early 12th century, Great Zimbabwe was located in the modern country of Zimbabwe, and it's the largest stone ruins below the Sahara. The evidence suggests that Shona kings and the very elite lived in the marvelously built stone fortifications. These brilliant edifices were the center of a flourishing gold trade that spanned across the Indian Ocean. The Shona people built the stone structures without mortar, which was indicative of a unique African style. The structures are so impressive that the modern nation of Zimbabwe took inspiration from the site. The Hongwe totem bird found at the site is a national symbol for the country of Zimbabwe today. In other words, the stone ruins were a symbol of African achievement, certainly one of the great gems of African civilization. That being said, European travelers and scholars seem to agree that this was indeed an achievement of the medieval world and thus found it difficult in admitting African parentage. The first intellectual gymnastics was played by Portuguese traders in the late 1500s. They thought it was a city of the legendary Queen of Sheba or the biblical city of Ophir from which the Queen of Sheba raised gold for the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. Unwilling to admit the city's sub-Saharan African origin and arguing that these peoples had no history of building in stone, later visitors to the ruins surmised that Phoenicians, Arabs, Egyptians, or even the fabled Christian king Prester John had built Great Zimbabwe. This initial reaction by the Portuguese may be forgivable as some Portuguese travelers proclaimed that the Shona people did indeed build them. However, the allure of biblical fantasies was apparently just too powerful. In 1871, Karl Mach continued this erroneous tradition by associating Great Zimbabwe with King Solomon's biblical Ophir. Cecil Rhodes and his followers, called the Rhodesians, illustrated the apotheosis of falsehood. Inspired by what they took for Great Zimbabwe's extraneous origins, Rhodes settlers, known as Rhodesians, called the hill ruin at Great Zimbabwe the Acropolis, and the valley ruin, following their suppositions about Near Eastern religious ceremonies in the valley, the temple. Despite evidence to the contrary, adduced by archaeologists David Randall MacGyver, Gertrude Catton Thompson and Roger Summers, local belief in Great Zimbabwe's exotic origins remain an article of settler faith. In truth, 
Genuine scholarship tried to break the Eurasian-centric utopian tradition, but imperial and commercial interests often won the day. The Rhodesians obstinately maintained their Eurasian hypothesis, despite unassailable proofs. Nonetheless, Rhodesians erroneously attributed hill and valley ruins to Phoenicians, Jews, and Arabs. Anyone, in fact, but the site's historical Shona builders. A host of local diggers, Theodore Bent, R. M. Swan, and R. N. Hall, bolstered early mythmaking about the site that became a defining characteristic of colonial worldviews. In his book, The Ruined Cities of Ancient Rhodesia, Hall argued that Phoenicians were responsible for Great Zimbabwe's construction. Ancient Semites had provided the organizational skills and the intelligence without which the Shona could never have built their architectural marvels. Another African achievement attributed to other people were the beautiful Ife heads of the Yoruba people. The brass and terracotta sculptures of the Yoruba city of Ele Ife are among the best in the world. By the 10th and 11th centuries, Ele Ife was a flourishing city with a lavish court for its ruler, who was known as the Oni. In addition to his political leadership, the Oni was also considered the spiritual leader of all the Yoruba. Although Benin and Oyo were more powerful cities, Ele Ife was revered for its religious and cultural importance, especially its art and sculpture. Ele Ife was also renowned for its bronze castings which were made using the lost wax process, the same technique used by the ancient Greeks. The beauty and splendor of the Ife sculptures are undeniable. It exemplifies African achievement and it's certainly on par with any in the world. In fact, what was all the more impressive about the sculptures and testament to the African skill and mastery of metallurgy was how the artists at Ele Ife created casts of nearly pure copper, a feat that artists of ancient Greece and Rome, the Italian Renaissance, and Chinese bronze casters never achieved. Based on this historical perspective, one can imagine how impressed foreigners were upon their discovery of the Ife sculptures. Reflexively, they were critical or outright denied African invention. Leo Frobenius, a German archaeologist, was the first to undertake serious work in Ife in 1910, and his ethnographic study was the principal source on this topic for quite some time. Frobenius was soon afterwards taken to a grove of Osanian to the northwest of the palace. The main feature was a nondescript stone, but he was much more interested in two fragments of a terracotta face in a naturalistic style, which he and Martius, his mining engineer assistant, picked up from the ground surface. He thought them reminiscent of ancient Greece and a proof that once upon a time a race far superior in strain to the Negro had been settled here. His most popular find was a brass head known as Olokun. The excellence of that sculpture only affirmed his Eurocentric disposition. Frobenius thought he had found evidence of a Greek colony on the Atlantic coast of Africa. The intellectual leaps were pretty profound and his publications merely codified it for popular culture. The publication of these finds astonished the art world just as Frobenius had been astonished almost 30 years before. The heads were unlike any known African art and being in a style of quasi-menstruational naturalism had an immediate appeal to those trained in the canons of European taste. These heads could be judged without condescension as works of art in their own right. They would stand comparison with anything which ancient Egypt, classical Greece and Rome, or Renaissance Europe had to offer. It was assumed that they must have been made elsewhere than Ife and imported or else, since many of the heads are clearly Negroid, made in Africa by an artist working in one of these traditions. The evidence which pointed to an African origin was scarcely considered. The attribution of African achievements to non-African sources proves the bankruptcy of the dark continent trope. Thankfully, we're slowly moving away from that tradition. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos and want to help in its continued production, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace. Hey!